Thank you very much, and thank you to the Coalition of the Chamber uh, for inviting me today. I had the uh, opportunity to watch your governor give his State of the State uh, speech last night. And Kansas is in a uh, interesting uh, position because Kansas, uh, with the list, with both the House and the Senate leadership and uh, membership that you have, uh, committed on tax and spend regulatory issues and reforming some of the mistakes of the last several decades uh, in terms of drift has a real opportunity to be a leader and there are now uh, 25 states sort of similarly situated uh, like Kansas is. These are the 25 red states with a Republican governor and a Republican legislature, 12 D's blue states, Democrat governor, Democratic legislature. The red states can turn themselves into Texas or Hong Kong as quickly as they want, and the blue states can turn themselves into California or Greece as quickly as they want, and they are. <clears throat> but uh, as you know, on the obviously on the tax issue, you now have the governor of Louisiana and Nebraska and Oklahoma and North Carolina all wanting to follow in the path uh, that you've laid out. So I think the leadership that uh, this coalition is showing on immigration is equally important because uh, states have to decide what they want to do uh, on the immigration issue and they're going to be looking to successes and they're going to be looking at failures uh, and we have some of both. Kansas is also unique uh, in its Chamber of Commerce. It is, uh, and I'm extremely impressed at how competent and useful and positive uh, the Kansas Chamber of Commerce is compared to, say, the California Chamber of Commerce, which sits down with the, with the governor and negotiates tax increases on a regular basis um, and is not part of the solution. Uh, but when it comes to the immigration issue, I noticed that uh, it seemed to be odd that the party of Ronald Reagan, the party of George Herbert Walker Bush, the party of George W. Bush, all of whom recognized uh, that one of the things that makes us stronger than all other nations is our more open and welcoming immigration policy, not just the, the legal policies, but also the, wealth, the uh, willingness of the American people to accept folks from all over the world uh, and to have them become Americans, uh, is what separates us from other countries. If you want to look at why we're going to succeed and China isn't, why we're uh, moving, even with our present difficulties, while we're moving forward and Japan isn't, why Europe does not have much of a future. Uh, among other things, they're forgetting to have kids, but they're also unable uh, to accept immigrants into their countries. Uh, China is going to get old before it gets rich. Uh, it can't do immigration for various cultural reasons. Uh, it's going to have a declining population in not too long, and that's going to continue for some time. Japan has already hit that point. Remember, we used to sit around and worry about Japan all day overcoming us, okay? Because they couldn't do immigration and, and decided not to have kids, they're not moving forward and not able to continue, not only not growing as a country, but beginning to shrink. The Europeans are in the same position. Uh, the United States, on the other hand, is both a growing economy and a growing country. Everything from our national security to our standing in the world to our economic growth is one of the major factors of what we do right versus other countries. We do property rights, not as good as we should, but better than most of the other countries. Uh, we tend to have a less destructive government than other countries, not as much as we like, but better than other countries. And we're way ahead of other countries in the ability uh, to have immigrants come to, our, uh, to the United States and become Americans uh, very rapidly and contribute to the growth of our economy, both in big cities and in rural areas. So it's one of the strengths that we have as, as a nation, and I think it's very important for us to keep an eye on that, because if you sort of get some stuff right, if you have the right tax policy, but you get the wrong immigration policy, you can do great damage to a state's economy or to the national economy. And uh, we want to talk about the economics of it, which are clear. I mean, the idea that more people means people get paid less and are worse off is a Malthusian, left-wing, labor union, stupid idea that has been disproved again and again and again. How many times do we have to have this discussion with Malthus and the anti-people crowd that somehow more people make us a, a, a less off 
less well-off country, okay? I mean, are we richer or poorer with 300 million Americans or 3 million Americans, which is what we had at one point, okay? The idea that these are people who don't understand the free market, who don't understand economics, who don't understand that people are a resource, not a liability, okay? Lawyers are a liability, people are a resource. Um, these are net additions uh, to economic growth. Uh, and it, it always surprised me, the left-wing, discredited left-wing rhetoric of those people who would undermine America's history, tradition, and the strength that we have of immigration um, are borrowing rhetoric and lousy economics from the AFL-CIO uh, and from Malthus and from the zero population crowd uh, and does not belong in the modern center-right Reagan Republican Party, center-right American <coughs> views. It, it, it's some foreign Trojan horse that people keep trying to drag into the middle uh, of, of Ronald Reagan's America that doesn't belong there. Uh, on economics, we've seen that uh, where you have more immigration, you actually have more growth. Uh, I mean, this is, should not be a surprise. Uh, and where some states have decided that to close down their agriculture by having uh, uh, strong anti-immigrant uh, laws, they've done tremendous damage uh, to their agricultural industry in particular. Uh, and we've also seen you go to the high-tech people and ask Bill Gates why they're building plants in Canada because they can get high-skilled immigrants into Canada and can't get them into the United States. Uh, my favorite comment from Steve Jobs was his conversation with uh, President uh, Obama, where he told him he was stupid. Uh, and where that came from was Jobs said, I can build you 120 plants. Uh, building apples and iPads and so on across the United States. If you'll give me an immigration policy that allows me to find the, the, the engineers that I can't get right now. And don't tell me that in 20 years you'll show up with some. I'm talking now, okay? You give me an immigration policy, I can find the engineers. We'll start building factories to create jobs of all kinds um, in and around those factories across the United States. And Obama said he wasn't interested in doing that. And that's when Steve Jobs told him he was stupid, um, okay? We shouldn't be stupid. Other people ought to be stupid. That's not where we ought to be uh, in terms of economic policy. Now, what I think is very helpful is that the politics on this has uh, moved in the wrong direction for a while and is now clearly moving in the right direction, which is surprising because if you looked at it, it's always been there. The modern Republican Party has nominated the most pro-immigrant candidate for president since Ronald Reagan. The idea that there's some sort of anti-immigrant real part of the modern Republican Party that votes on that issue is just factually incorrect. Ronald Reagan won as the pro-immigrant candidate. Bush did, Bush did. Uh, John McCain I had many objections to John McCain. as It wasn't my first choice as a presidential candidate, but he was clearly the most, the Republican most identified with the idea of, of, uh, of, of a reasonable level of immigration in this country and treating immigrants with decency and respect and winning their support and having them become part of the American fabric. And he won the, the nomination against others who were making another case. One of the reasons we get confused on the politics of immigration, and for those of you who understand the free market and get uh, economics, I don't need to make the case for you about mobility of labor and, and immigration being very good for the economy. Um, uh, but let's also look at the politics of it, because politics often gets in the way of sound economic policy. That's the story of the last four years. Uh, and our job is to make the politics work so that the economics works better. Uh, in politics, there are in issues of voter intensity, and there are issues of preference. When you ask somebody, um, well, again, what gets confusing is when preference and intensity don't move in the same direction. Conservatives in 1980s were arguing for prayer in school, and 90% of the people in the room would say, yes, we should do that, and 3% of the room, uh, religious minorities and dissenters would, would get upset, and the only people who remembered the speech on election day were the 3%. So intensity was running counter to preference, because 90% of the people in the room said, I'm for that, okay. I don't vote on it, but I'm for it. Uh, and the liberals make the same mistake on, on, on gun control all the time. They give a speech and they say I'm for reasonable gun control and they'll see some people nodding in the head and they'll miss the fact that 5% of the people in the room go, 
I will remember this and I'll vote against you.